having a trusted friend in your uh, decision making group that that can tell you everything it's hard but if you can create manufacture that person you're going to make better decisions welcome to the thinking leader brought to you by red team thinking bad leaders react good leaders plan and great leaders think each week you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives military experts and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello there, and welcome to another show. Bryce, good day. Who do we have joining us on the show today? Oh, Marcus, I am so excited today. We have with us Moran Cern. Moran is a professor of neuroscience and business at Columbia Business School. But more importantly than that, he is one of the world's leading experts on how the brain works. We have so much to unpack here oh, and, yes. and so many different things I want to talk about. Welcome to the show, Moran. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to meet you. So, Moran, you and I first first connected after I read a, a fascinating piece. I think it was in January of this year. We'll put a link to it in the show notes uh, in in FT, the Financial Times, um, where you talked about you raised the question about whether giving the nuclear launch codes to an artificial intelligence was really such a bad idea, after all, given the limits of human decision making under, under particularly under stress. And I, I found it fascinating and unfortunately timely. So I, I'd love to, to, to have you unpack that for our listeners and viewers. Sure. So indeed, I'm a neuroscientist and I study the brain. And when I was roped into looking at the nuclear decision-making processes, it became clear to me that there are some flaws that are inherent in the protocols. Uh, assumptions about how humans make decisions that we know are not true anymore. And even when I looked further in the past to the guys who set the protocols, like scientists, like my colleagues uh, from game theory, who wrote the protocols back in the 40s and 50s, they wrote in their book something like, we know this is not a full story. Someday we're going to know more about the brain or about decision making, and we're going to adapt those. And pretty much nothing happened. And one of the biggest assumptions uh, and it's written in Thomas Schelling's book, kind of in one sentence that stood out to me. It says, we assume that the agent, that's the leader in, in charge, is a rational, composed, and measured. Now, you can imagine right now all the people who hold this position in current days or, or in the past couple of years, they're not that. And when I thought about that, I said, okay, either there's a problem with the protocol that we need to fix by changing the protocol, or if we want someone who is measured, composed, and rational, there are machines that are that, and we can bring them into the system. And the, the question wasn't, uh, hey, should we replace the president with a machine or not, even though it kind of evolved into this question at some point, but whether what is it that we want? A rational person, or we intentionally want someone who's a little bit erratic that will keep the protocol scary? And those are the questions that I brought in. And the AI was a way for us to test that by kind of a, every time a human being made a choice and it was a mistake, we showed that an AI can make the right one. And we said, if, if you're only about the correct one, you just lost to a machine. So tell me why you should be the one making the decision still. Interesting. And you guys have come up with a, a simulation to, to help leaders understand this, this risk. Right. So, so generally, when, when we started, we just took one by one all kinds of spaces where decisions are critical, and we try to see can machines first replace the human and second aid the human. So replace was very controversial because people like to be the decision maker, but we, we looked at things like driving cars where machines are much better than humans in making sure that there are no accidents, uh, medical mistakes, medical diagnosis, uh, in, in a legal system, making a judgment based on the facts without any biases. A lot of those things, it turned out machines were better. They also uh, were better even when we didn't do a good job in the sense that when, when a judge makes a mistake because they're biased and the machine learns the same biases, they're both making a bad decision, but at least machines are easy to fix. 
It's very easy to change the code. It's very hard <laughs> to take a racial uh, biased judge and change their racism for years. So machines are easier to I fix. Think we, I think we're, we're beginning to see that in some countries right now. <laughs> right. So that was the first kind of just step one. And then when we realized that even though we can prove that in some cases machines are better, no one actually wants Terminator 2 to be a <laughs> reality. So we said, okay, so fine, we don't want that, but can we help humans? And where we landed was on something that we call in, in this kind of in the uh, jargon of AI, digital twin. Digital twin is we take Marcus and Bryce and we essentially train a machine to think like them. So there's a copy of Marcus in the machine, a copy of Bryce God in the machine. the world. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can console them. So if you're under stress and there's like, you know, the, the countdown clock counts to 15 minutes before a detonation happens and you have to make a choice and you're nervous and panicked and you can't think straight and you are tired because it's 3 a.m., all the classical movie things, you can at least yeah. say, bring me my Biden in a box. And I'm going to ask yesterday's Biden, what would he do? And then you have somehow a version of yourself that helps you. So you're removing the stress of the situation from yourself and having the mirror looking back at you, giving you the sage advice that you'd have given if you weren't under that position. And you still make the decision yourself. It's still you making, but you shouldn't get advice from someone who was trained on you and that you trust because they proved in the past to think like you in various simulations. And then in the end, you still make a choice and you might say the opposite of the Biden in a box, so to speak. But at least you kind of got uh, advice I've, from that. I've seen this. No? Yeah. So I've seen this in, in the military way. We have, you know, you have senior officers making decisions, but they have their right hand man, their sort of PA who's, who's been with them for years. And as they're making decisions, they say, sir, you know, are you sure you want to make that? Because normally I wouldn't have expected you to say that. And then they're witnessing the stress coming onto them, but it's not on the individual. It's on the, the person who's making that decision and someone coming in being that sort of realistic twin, I guess. But yeah, that's fascinating. I was going to say, Marcus, you 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 haven't had your finger on the big red button, but you have <laughs> had your finger on the red button. Marcus Indeed. Marcus Moran was on during the uh, during the uh, was it the opening ceremonies or the closing yeah, ceremony? Yeah, the whole Olympics for the London twenty twelve. Uh, in twenty twelve, was in the bunker with Theresa May, with the authority to authorize shoot down of planes uh, over oh. London, and yeah. so it's a similar type of calculus. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, yeah. How how does the information you're taking in how does your biases how does your fear take that over you and we did a simulation i remember we did a simulation once and we didn't realize it was a simulation we got a a turn back call out of edinburgh the, the the hijack code went on this aircraft turned around started coming back towards edinburgh and there was me another junior officer and a corporal and we sat down went through all of our procedures contacted down in the street got the prime minister on the line and this thing started coming back and my junior officer lost it wow. he was shaking quaking couldn't speak and i didn't realize it was a simulation we were carrying on then no then i noticed that about six people had arrived in the room we didn't even see them come in we were that absorbed in what we were doing and they were at the back taking notes but my corporal ended up taking over i just said corporal smith take over you know lieutenant jones just sit out and watch two of us can handle this until he composed himself but that realistic first time impression of what was happening and it could have been a real event absolutely knocked him so you can train for these things all the time but then when it comes to fruition how you're going to respond you don't know that's so having someone else there to do that and call you out and help you was actually a really good model if you'd been on your own who knows what could have happened amazing and i'll add to that one thing that if we kind of started by talking about ai in the war environment uh, and we equated it to another person who knows you really well who gives you an advice whose job is to kind of be the same version of you from yesterday uh, it becomes even more concerning and difficult when ai also could be the enemy meaning uh, right now all of our alarm systems are machines we we know that there's a missile launch because some detector out there tells us there's heat uh, concentration in this location and in many ways, the playbook of an attack right now wouldn't be attacking just us humans. It would be attacking our systems that will tell us something. So, so we would have a machine that we have to protect, like we protect our brain, saying, how do I know that this machine, the Biden in a box that we kind of named it in this show uh, right now, isn't hacked? And now I'm getting an advice from someone, but I don't know that he really is me or a copy of me that was kind of somehow hacked and is now giving me a bad advice. So you have to start thinking like, 
how do I trust my own brain and how do I trust my brain, the outsourced version? Well, this actually happened in, in, in the Soviet Union in the 1980s, right? I mean, the, the, you had uh, the, the, uh, the Soviet launch detection system mistakenly, I think it was reflections off clouds uh, of solar radiation that led to it detecting the launch of a small number of missiles. And I can't remember the name of the, the fairly junior Soviet officer who saved the world by, by ignoring Petrov. protocol and um, Petrov. Yeah. By ignoring protocol and refusing to 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 launch a strike because it didn't make sense to him when he looked at it, and I think I think that you know that that's a really important thing for folks to keep in mind as we move into a world where we have a growing prevalence of you know intelligent machines, uh, you know, making decisions or help giving us inputs for decisions. But I, I want to come back to something you said, Moran, because you know when you were talking about the Biden in the box. I was thinking how how much how much how much even more powerful it would be if if the president could sit with Biden in a box from yesterday and say Reagan in a box next to him and consult both of them and see Absolutely. to have two different agents programmed with different biases with different different you know optimized for different things and then ultimately have the president make the final decision based on the choices made by, by two different multiple persona inputs to aid decision making. Wow. In many ways, since we in the US allocated this decision only to presidents, and mm -hmm. there are only several of them alive right now, and only, a f only they were in the position to really think about this carefully, it's actually really important for them to talk to each other. So mm -hmm. regardless of what side of the aisle you sit, it's really useful for an incoming president to have his kind of predecessors talk to him and tell him or her in the future how they thought about it. And in this near miss, what did I do and so on? And that kind of brain in a box, so to speak, if we could start doing that for every president and keep a log of that would mean that while the conditions are very different in every case, you still have something from the only few people in the world who had this position as an advice. It's not an optimal situation that we have right now, though, where you have someone who who may or may not have a background that qualifies them mm -hmm. to make decisions like this. Exactly. Put in a position where with with no real training to make perhaps the most important decision in human history. You know, when I teach, uh, I, I teach uh, in a business school, leaders of companies who mm -hmm. essentially want to know how do we train the president for this mm -hmm. choice? And of course they care about the kind of gossip component of how does the training happen? What do they know? What do they do? And so on. So there's a lot of that. But in the end, I always tell them there is a mapping between those decisions to yours. Every person, every one of your listeners in their life is going to make a handful, maybe five, of these type of choices. They won't be as devastating as nuclear launch, but they would be, for their perspective, the biggest choices they make in their life when they kind of go to their deathbed and look back. And, and we can count, we can really list them. It's going to be who to marry or the decision to get married would be one. The proposal, the acceptance is one of those choices that you make presumably once in your lifetime, maybe not that many times. <laughs> so, so, uh, so you, you, you unless you're Elizabeth Taylor, in which case maybe, you know, <laughs> so that's one, the decision to have a child or to abort or to end a pregnancy. Those are kind of those choices, the decision to, uh, buy something extremely expensive that you can't afford, like, you know, acquiring uh, a company for CEOs or uh, even buying a house for the average person in the millions of dollars with mortgages and so on, that those fall in this category. Maybe decision to end a life if you're a soldier or a doctor or if you pull the plug on grandma. Uh, those are the choices that you might have. That's about it. Like tattoos might be an, a, a low <laughs> uh, stakes version of that. But that's about it. So, so What's common to them is that you don't really have a lot of training. You can't really take advice from others per se, because whatever their proposal was doesn't apply to you. Even if you do it more than once, it's likely very different when you buy a house at age 30 to when you buy it at age 70. So you really are starting every time again and again. And in that case, you're similar to the president who comes to the choice with a lot of experience in life, but not knowing how to do this one. It's interesting. I guess the thing that is different is the time the time scale, particularly now in the era of hypersonic missiles? What do we have? Five minutes to make a decision, 
at most. Uh, so one of the things we actually do and, and we borrow from other countries' protocols is suggest uh, slowing it down. In a way, if the missiles are coming at you, and as long as you're like the US, uh, uh, are full of like submarines and bombers that are not going to be destroyed, even if a launch uh, actually <clears throat> manifests itself in the US, you can take time. You don't have to kind of uh, hear that the missiles from North Korea are on their way and immediately press the missiles to uh, uh, the launch kind of missiles attack on uh, as an offense. You can say, okay, we're going to absorb the attack. It's going to take six hours for us to verify that it came from where it came and to know what we're going to do, decide, and then launch a counter strike. So, so it, it doesn't have to be the movie. The movie kind of version where the countdown clock counts to zero and you have kind of Mr. President, you have one minute to decide and is an option. It's not the necessary kind of only option. Except unless it's a, a full scale attack by the by the Russians, I guess. Yeah. But I think in those situations as well, Moran, is where where the individual who may be cool, calm, collected, making those decisions, those around them and in those sort of situations, they're not normally on their own with a box or with a couple, there's normally a room full. How those people react and respond and behave can impact the person's decision making themselves. So you've got to be very cognizant of how that happens in a real and obviously in train this and exercises to see how people, as I talked about earlier, how they behave because it's a huge trigger point for how you're then responding to those around you. To speak to Bryce's and yours kind of comment right now, I'll add that he mentioned earlier we had this kind of experiment run by a colleague of mine, Sharon Wiener, where she actually brought a VR setup to the Munich Defense Conference. And she took a lot of defense experts, sometimes very senior ones, and had them go through a simulation where she puts a headset on them and then they take the oath of office of the US president and now they're the president. And immediately mm -hmm. as they do so, kind of a surprise attack happens and they see all kinds of screens with information. And she sits in the back with a little display so when they ask a question, she can prompt an answer. And the reality is that most of the answers she gives them are, we don't know, it's going to take some time. So it keeps them in ambiguity. But the interesting thing, I think, to speak to the point we just spoke about is that they were given 15 minutes. They were all told, you have 15 minutes to respond. As long as you do it by the 15 minutes, you're good to go. Most people chose to respond after less than five. So the panic wow. in the room made them, even though we tell them you can take time, you, more information is going to come, you can ask more questions, the panic and the need to do something and the feeling that, okay, I'm just going to sit here and wait, nothing's going to happen, made most people just say after five minutes, okay, clearly a missile is coming, counter strike. And what we're trying to say is maybe not six hours, maybe not 24 hours, maybe, but generally, if you can take time and, and slow down the process, it's helping the brain. It's a good uh, opportunity for people to reflect and think. It's a good opportunity for more information. So as long as you can stretch the time, and sometimes mm -hmm. the stretch could be very little, but if you can, it's almost always useful to do that. That's one of the best pieces of advice I ever got as a leader was if you have a decision to make, leave it until the last ultimate possible moment to make it, however much time you have. Right. You know, if it's two days, go away, come back and make it at the final minute. Because, and especially as we talk about today in this VUCA world, how quickly things can change. And why would you force yourself to time compress that decision to be made when especially the high stakes are at play here? So that could be a simple I think that's call, really you, important yeah. advice. Yeah, I find, I find that, you know, this is something I've tried to cultivate in my own life, is to remind myself just that, which is that, mm -hmm. do you really need to make that decision right now? Do you really need to send that email right now? Do you really need to send that message right now? Do you really need to make that call right now? And it's amazing how many times if you if you say, no, I don't, I'm going to pause, that you end up, something else ends up occurring to you in the time that you bought yourself that didn't occur to you. And I can add to that one point that we also do with train kind of leaders and senior leaders in the government is that every person has a profile of what I would call is their optimal decision state. So maybe Marcus makes the decision better in the morning and Bryce in the afternoon. And Marcus, when he's alone and Bryce, when he's surrounded by people, I am when, when I'm uh, hungry and someone when they're full or when they're in this emotional state. So there are a lot of things which by looking at your brain or by talking to you or by having you do exercises, we can actually extract your profile and give you the best chance. If you take enough time, you also can make sure that you're making a decision in your best state. If you're a morning person, it's now evening, and you're not required to make the choice right now, you can wait in the morning and get your get your brain to its favorite state and then make the same choice in the morning, just knowing that, okay, I was in the best 
moment. And this is true for presidents, but also for board members and for email senders. You can wait in the morning and do the email in the morning when you are ready. Some of the best advice in the world, sleep on it. Well, you know, and, and you're so right, Moran, you know, most most of us, hopefully none of us will ever have to make the decision about whether to, to mash down the big red button. But um, but we all make decisions that have high consequences in our lives and the same calculus comes into play. And I assume from a neuroscience point of view, a lot of the same function, both both biological and epistemological comes into play in in how we approach those decisions yeah so i mean we can we can list a few of them the biases yeah. that that you know that that make us buy something we don't need in the supermarket are the same biases that make us make decisions that are critical in the wrong moment like we buy a house the same way we buy coco pepsi uh, mm. we list, look at a lot of <laughs> options and and we kind of think that we know the market and we make so so knowing the biases knowing all the list of biases that that scientists have mapped is helpful uh, even ha having a good heuristics to numbers I i've been uh, talking a lot to people right now about numbers and it's one thing is to know statistics that's always hel helpful but even if you don't know statistics when you're a pregnant lady and the doctor comes to you and says, uh, we just ran a test and you have one in 20 billion chance of having Down syndrome. Oh, so sorry. It's actually one in 21 billion. What does it do to your brain? <laughs> like, do you, do you actually <laughs> think of it as the same? Like, I mean, the numbers change. It's 20 billion to 21 yeah. billion. For most people, it's the same. The brain kind of, it's, it's billions. I, I don't care. Or the opposite. If I tell you it's 0 0.0001 chance of happening, you probably say it's zero. So just having kind of heuristic and say, okay, when it's, when it's below 1 million, I'm doing this. When it's below 1 billion, yeah. I'm doing this. When it's, when it's Personal zero. Personal thresholds. It, it helps you kind of think about numbers differently. Um, there, there are all kinds of biases that we can have think about that, that are just useful when it comes to teams. Who gets to speak first? Is it, is it that everyone gets to speak whenever they want or you start with a junior person and climb up? We know that if the CEO says, we should acquire this company, what do you guys think? Most people will say, same thing. CEO, especially yeah. if it's North Korea and the CEO is, uh, you know, able to. Well, kill not you. even North Korea. I mean, especially if it's any co company in the United States. I mean, it, it or Europe. Absolutely. It's, it's. I mean, this is, you know, this gets into the core of what we do. You know, we have a simple tool that we teach folks called Think Right Share, which is rather than answering the question, everybody spends sixty seconds, two minutes, depending on the type of question, and thinks about their answer silently, and then writes it down. On, on an index card and somebody collects it, shuffles them, deals them back out and everybody reads the card that they have in front of them. Now, nobody knows who said what and nobody's Brilliant. influenced by anyone else's. Brilliant, it's as simple as that. So, so the protocols like anonymous versus public, What's a, what's a majority, right? Let's, let's say we have a vote you know, right now in Israel because uh, of the, the question about democracy. There are a lot of questions of like, what if two wolves and a sheep have a vote on whether to eat the sheep? Uh, uh, <laughs> it's, yes. a, it's a democracy, two against one. Yes. But the question is like, is every democracy okay? And, and, and that's a, a, in a way, a, a kind of a, an analogy to sometimes there's a majority and you have a majority, but it's 51 versus 49. And it's not the same as 99 versus one. And it's not the same mm -hmm. as even 100 to zero and defining in advance what would be uh, not just majority but one that we actually care about is its own version and what if we decide that we're gonna uh, vote with say 10 people but then one is missing so now we have nine people and it's still 100 percent, but it's actually one person missing is it the same as 100 percent if everyone is there all those small choices are choices that it's good to make before you're at the decision making process to, to before you kind of start voting while uh, before, like months before, you decide how will we approach this and that condition. And then when it comes, you're a lot more prepared to actually make a choice without feeling that the process was flawed. Yeah, I mean, these things, these things have huge consequences. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm from California and I'm, I'm broadcasting from California right now. And infamously here in this state, back in the 1970s, a law was passed, Proposition 13, which basically you're familiar with it, froze the ability to to increase property taxes on, on properties that aren't sold. And when it wasn't just the law that was passed, it was passed with a provision that the only way it could ever be overturned was with a four-fifths majority vote. Well, you can't, in the United States, you can't get a four-fifths majority to agree that the sky is blue on a sunny day. And, and, and that was done deliberately. And now we're in a situation where, you know, almost to me, I mean, I was a kid when it was passed. And I mean, with, as a kid, even the effects were apparent within a few years, parks were closing, things like this, 
governments were running out, local governments were running out of money. And it's, be, it's been this huge problem ever since. But because of that, that, that baking in that calculus of requiring that super, super majority, you've made something that, that, that has on the surface been a democratic decision that has contrived to be one of the most undemocratic thing that's, that's ever been imposed. And the vast majority of Californians almost immediately regretted it and wanted to overturn it. But there's zero chance of that happening because it would require such a huge vote to overturn it. And I think on that spoke, so, you know, we're venturing a little bit into general kind of election and auction and so on, which is yep. a fascinating topic in itself. And I would say <clears> that I just sat a few days ago in California in a, a gathering of a lot of scientists who tried to invent new ways to make decisions when it comes to voting. They just kind of sat there and said, like, if we, if we were given the authorization to invent a new way to elect officials and so on, what would you do? And they kind of spoke about a lot of examples like that. And I think that one of the things that came up is that indeed, most democracies converge to a system that gets to the point where a lot of people don't want what's happening and are unable to change that. And in that sense, they suggested something yeah. like refresh every X amount of time, which is true for a lot of decision-making protocols in our lives. If we do the same thing again and again and again all the time, it's potentially a good idea just occasionally to decide just for the sake of giving us a different mindset we always decided by you and me together kind of talking about that before we buy a house let's just for the next big purchase we're going to make involve our kids and our uh, you know, extended family mm -hmm. just as a way to see would we end up like thinking differently is it affecting the choices because we tend to not change the protocols often especially if they worked. And that is, I think, a mistake that is leading to us getting locked in choices that we don't like. Well, it's what you, you know, you referenced the, 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 the statement that Schelling made about revi revisiting game theory when we knew more about how the human brain works. This is something that, that, that most Americans don't know and, and is really an important oversight, which is that our founding fathers in this country were very explicit that they expected that the Constitution was going to be revised approximately once every decade, that they talked about how there would be, this is the first constitutional convention, and we anticipate that in 10 years or so, there'll be another, and we'll continually revise it. It's never been revised for all intents and purposes since then. And because and so we're locked in a situation of how people thought, how people viewed the world in, in, in the, the, the late 1700s, yeah. with yeah. very little ability to to modify that and it's contrary to the actual principles of the people who created it which is ironic I, i'm huge really eyes in the huge well interesting I, let's take a break here and when we come back i want to shift gears completely and go into the brain with you and talk about how our brain functions on the inside because you are a person who who gets your Get your hands wet <laughs> um, <laughs> and looking at how our brains work. So on that, on, on, on that teaser, uh, stay tuned and we'll be right back. Hey, folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a red team thinker? We have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. Welcome back. Wow. What an interesting conversation we've been having. So we've talked about Global thermonuclear war. We've we've talked about fixing democracy. We've talked about a lot of lot of external things. Let's 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 take let's open up our heads now, and and talk about the work that you do more on with with actual living breathing patients to understand how our brains work inside. Sure. So so I'll, I'll explain to everyone how we even get to have uh, access to humans' brains. Uh, I work with a team that uh, looks at patients who undergo brain surgery for clinical purposes. So if you see us, it means that something is not working and the only solution is to open your brain and figure out what's wrong with you from the inside. 
Take, for example, epilepsy. You have epilepsy, you have seizures. Doctors try to give you all kinds of medicine. Nothing worked. And you climb up the ladder of like more and more invasive things. And you get to the final one when the doctor says, we're going to open your brain. We're going to put neural implants, electrodes inside your head. And we're going to have you walk around for two weeks with electrodes inside while we listen to the activity of neurons in your brain and wait for you to have a seizure. And then when you have a seizure, we're going to know exactly where it starts. We're going to triangulate the location. We're going to take the wires out. We're going to resect the part of the brain that starts the seizures. We're going to close everything and you're going to walk away seizure free. So we're going to fix you. But the, the process to get there is to figure out exactly which neuron is the problematic neuron. But now comes more on. It says, I'm going to have a human being with an open brain, electrodes inside, recording continuously their activity while they walk around, talk to people, watch TV. I can actually investigate and study the brain in the most direct way by listening to the activity of neurons and seeing what they manifest. So I can ask Bryce a question, and before he answers, I can see that this neuron on the left is right is kind of firing, and then he says chocolate, and I say, okay, this is the neuron that decides chocolate, and I can ask him, do you prefer salad? And I see a different neuron fires, and I start mapping the brain at the level of neurons. And when you map the brain at the level of neurons, you can predict thoughts in a precise way, and also influence them by zapping those neurons and actually making Bryce choose salad versus chocolate whenever I want. That's the setup. So now you know how we get to have access to, to people's brains. And I would say that this research of mine gets a lot of attention right now because people like Elon Musk and others have basically took it and they're trying to make it into a commercial thing. They try to basically say, we're going to put neural implants in everyone's brain and we're going to offer that as a tool to replace your mobile phones, Samsung or, or iPhone tool. So you can just think a thought. The machine inside your head is going to think that, translate that to digital signal and you're going to get uh, Wikipedia entries straight to your brain or Google Maps is going to tell you where to go. That's why you may have heard about it. In the lab, what we do is to try to use it right now to read people's brains, read their thoughts and pro project their thoughts on a screen and mostly to decode dreams. That's kind of the main thing we're doing right now. So you go to sleep and we not just like record your thoughts when you're awake, but let you dream things and see what we can extract. That's the kind of intro to what we do. So wow. many questions. <laughs> yeah. So okay. what what are some of the biggest surprises that you've seen in your work that have made you go, huh, when you've seen how our brains actually function at that level? I'll give you two. The, the first one has to do with free will. And the second with uh, how simple humans are. So in free will, we found neurons in people's brain that... Uh, start firing, they kind of get active seconds before the person makes a choice. In the simplest version we did, they, they are asked to press a red button. This ties us actually to the previous, previous uh, topic. We put a little uh, <laughs> red button and we asked them to press left or right. And it's just a mundane experiment, just press left, right, whenever you want. But we find cells in their brain that tell us seconds before they choose to press and which one to press, left or right, which one it is. And what we can do is we can essentially separate the decision from the action so much so that we can tell them, look, uh, you're about to press a button. And just one thing, when you press the button, a light's going to turn on. And we ask you to not touch anything with the lights on. But actually what we do is we read their intent to press the button and we turn the lights on before they press the button. So then there's a buzzer in the room and we tell them, what did you do, Marcus? We told you not to press the button when the light's on. I'm so sorry, doctor. It kind of happened by itself. Say, so never mind, just don't do it again. And we do it again and again. Every time they're about to press the button, we turn the lights on and they get this visceral experience that they have no free will because every time they know something, I knew about it seconds before them and I can work their brain against them. This is a surprising moment for me, for them, and for all of us thinking that Whenever we make a choice, this is when we made a choice. And we realized that, no, actually the choice was sitting there dormant for time and we we're just exposed to it afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. And the second one, I think mm. that was uh, as kind of big for me was just seeing how we can puppeteer people into zapping things in their brain and then they act and they think it was their choice. So I can zap your brain and make you move your hand, but I ask you, why did you move your hand? And you won't say, I don't know, it just happened, or you zapped my brain. You would start owning it. You'd say, well, I really wanted to grab this thing. So, so our brain can't sit in a situation of kind of no agency, so it makes up a story. And even though it's clear what happened, people immediately, and all of us would be that, make up a story that says, I'm the hero of my life. Nothing happened to mm -hmm. me, I chose that, and this, to me was surprising and explained a little bit of like how we end up where we are, where we constantly take ownership of things as if we wanted them. 
And how much of this left brain, right brain discussion have, have you seen as, is it the myth or the reality? Because it, you know, everyone discusses it. There are kind of What's three, that come up. three, three, let's say kind of contemporary topics that come. One is left brain, right brain. The other one is, do yeah. we use hundred percent of our brain? And the third one is, is there a difference between men and women's brain? Those are the three that always come up. They, they all have some grain of like, there, there's something there, but it, it, in the contemporary conversation, it became a topic of like a, much more than that. So, so there are differences between left and right brains. For sure, mm -hmm. language sits only on this side of the brain, on the left side, and decision making that has to do with emotions, biases towards right. And so there are those things. It's not really that there's a person who was kind of born and they're just better at this or better at that. The brain is plastic enough that you can essentially do whatever you want with, with those left and right things. So the, the, uh, what we call it kind of the latent, the, 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 um, the fact that the brain has kind of ch sides for everything doesn't really impact that. Bryce is a, an emotional person and Marcus is a rational person. This is not as true as, as people think. Like it, it's more colloquial. Like I'm a left brain person. That's one myth. The, the, the second one is about a hundred percent of the brain. Uh, we kind of try to even track the history of that, but the bottom line is humans use a hundred percent of the brain. It's just not at, at, at the same time. It's like a piano. Right. You don't play all the keyboard at the same time. You use some, some keys at any given point. That's, that's everything is gets used at some point. Just some gets used less, some gets used more, but all of them will be used and we have access to all of them. And men and women brain, that's the one where usually when, when I get asked this question, be careful now. Warning. Exactly, warning. I, I have, I have a prepared statement. <laughs> when I get asked that, first of all, my first comment is that always the question comes from a woman. I, I've never had a man ask me that question. So that, that's kind of, kind of anecdote one. I don't care. And, and, and the, the other option I always, I always kind of note is that typically if I probe live on stage with the person who asks, it's typically a personal question that they have about their boyfriend. Okay. Why is he doing this? <laughs> I say, okay. So, so, so I can tell you that there are differences in the brains of men and women. Mm -hmm. And it even manifests in functions. There are some things that men are doing better, like spatial control. And so there are some things that women do better, like, like kind of counterintuitive navigation, actually. That, that, that kind of, you know, the colloquial TV show thing is like, a, 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 I, I'm going to be lost without you guys. So it, that's actually tr not true. Women uh, have a better kind of navigation system. There are those things. But typically, when people ask that, it's because of a personal uh, issue at home <laughs> that they want scientists to prove that he needs to do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing that I think is so interesting about particularly the second thing you brought up about what surprised you, the, the, the ability to manipulate the brain and the inability of the brain to be aware that it's being manipulated is that in a world of deep fakes and, and you know, exponential Moore's law level advancement in the ability to create artificial realities around us. What are the consequences of that for our brains? Not great uh, in one uh, sentence. It means that we're going to have less and less things we can trust. So right now, you might have doubts about videos you see on YouTube. And you might say, okay, I don't think this is Obama speaking. It was a deep fake. Or I don't think this is Trump. This is a deep fake. Because I wouldn't expect Trump to say those things or Obama to say those things. You still have the filters of your uh, mm -hmm. senses to tell you, I want to kind of vet this content. But you don't have that from within. Right now, uh, we're talking, the three of us, we're creating a memory of this experience. If someone comes to you tomorrow, Marcus, and says, Marcus, it was so great that yesterday we played tennis. And they say, no, no, I was actually on a podcast with Moran. And they say, no, we played tennis. And you say, no, I remember, I was in a podcast. And they start showing you, they can show you footage of you playing tennis in a video. And you say, this is a deep fake. They could have 10 friends tell you, Marcus, I, you were with us. You won't trust them because you trust your memory fully. Yeah. Like nothing can... can override your own memory of this experience. When we get to a world where someone can put a neural implant in your brain and start essentially hacking your thoughts, you would have memories that you wouldn't be sure anymore. So the deep fakes would be from within. And you might say, wait, I remember myself talking to Moan, but all my friends say that we were playing tennis and there's so many of them saying that and, and they show me a beautiful video that shows me playing tennis. Maybe my memory is flawed. And the, the, the level of uncertainty is at the maximum amount because you can't trust anything, including your own mind. And that is, this is basically stuff of black crazy. mirror, isn't it? it, it I mean, the, the best example we have for that right now is uh, people with all kinds of brain disorders, schizophrenia. And basically mm -hmm. what, what happens is that they see something. So from their reality, there is a person, they're talking to them. And you can argue till tomorrow, you can then know there's no one, uh, what they can do, you know, John Nash, the, the famous uh, uh, economist, he was able to live with that, meaning he saw people, everyone told him these people are not there. 
And he said, okay, if I want to function in society, I need to just ignore the, this person that I see because I'm the only one seeing this. He was able to function. But most people with schizophrenia aren't. They just see someone and it's like Bryce telling me, you know, it's just the two of us here. Marcus doesn't exist. So what do you mean? He just asked a question. I answered. They said, yeah, it was all in your mind. Only the two of us are here. There is no Marcus. I would have to, I can, I can accept it. I can play the game of ignoring Marcus entirely, uh, uh, telling myself I'm not looking at him and so on. But the reality is that my brain presents Marcus. And I have to work mm -hmm. hard against my brain to not trust my own mind. And that is something that we have not experienced right now. That's the next version. And how, how much of that brain power is used to do that? Because you're trying to do something contrary to what you want to do. Is that, is that a huge drain on the brain that pulls you away? Or is it because I'm just trying to relate this to what people are doing and seeing day to day from their own perspectives? So we haven't had this maximal amount yet because the people, mm -hmm. the, 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 the number of people who have neural implants that, that can be hacked and, and is, is tiny. There's a, in the US only 40,000 people, which is not nothing, but it's very few people that actually have something in their brain that you can hack into and create new versions of reality for them that will fool their brain and so on. So we don't really know. With, with people with schizophrenia, that's the closest version of that. If they see a psychiatrist, they go through a long therapy that basically try to tell them, look, you have to trust me. If you want to function in society, you have to ignore this voice and trust this voice and so on. They're able to do that. Uh, so we have successes on making it happen. It's extremely difficult and it's taxing on the brain. These people spend a lot of energy trying to just ignore voices that are not there just to function properly. If this is going to be all of us, we're going to reduce, I would make up a number, 10% of our brain capacity just dealing with our own mind, creating things that are not there. But here's the thing, <clears throat> you know, Moran, I, I listen to what you're saying and I say, do we even need to wait till people have neural implants for this to happen? Because as we, as we find ourselves living in what, uh, one, one of the most frightening terms that, that I've ever imagined hearing a uh, post-truth society, um, and one that increasingly is capable of generating outside of our heads, very compelling evidence of things that are not true or alternate realities or alternate facts, is it not already beginning and will it not only increase the taxing of our brains just processing external information mm -hmm. and trying to trying to separate reality from, from, from manufactured reality and at a certain point does it become so taxing that we start to become untethered from reality? So you, you definitely... Looking at the pessimistic approach, and it's, it's a very me. likely one. I'm a little Miss Sunshine. Is <laughs> yes, I you. That's the one. Yeah. I, so I think you're right. The reality I have right now is kind of a, a you know micro version of what could be, and we're already pretty doing a pretty bad job. And mm -hmm. it's easy to make it even harder for us. So right now, you open your browser and you see an article that says uh, uh, humans have landed on Mars. You basically go to your mental states and you say, how likely is it? I know reality. It makes no sense. And after, say, two seconds, you say, this is fake and I'm moving on. You still spend two seconds on this article. Mm -hmm. And you maybe spent a couple of hours in your life figuring out that you should trust this website and not that website. So you have this also as kind of a backdrop to your decision. So you have a little bit of like effort made. If you live in a world where you can have infinite articles, if it's just two seconds to know that this one is true, so imagine you wake up in the morning and you see a website that looks like the New York Times or like CNN or like Fox News, whatever preference you have. It looks like it and there's an article there and you say it makes no sense. And then you look at another one and it makes no sense. Another one that makes no sense. And there are millions of them. And you have to weed out all of them to find the one that makes sense. You just wasted hours of your time. So then you start maybe relying on your friends and then you have an echo chamber effect, which you only trust the friends that you actually asked the question in the beginning, or you trust an AI who has to fight another AI because your AI tries to weed out the bad ones, but the other AI tries to create ones. So you kind of a battle between AIs and what's true. Either way, without even going to neural implants, we're looking at a world where if the battle is about your reality and machines are involved and we have finite time, we're in trouble. How close? So, how do that? we guard against that? What 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 is your advice to to people in terms of how they can preserve the the their their mental not sanity I would say but sanitation almost you know I'll give you one uh, uh, so yeah. so this both I, I I should tell so so it would be kind of full disclosure I spent ten years of my life before I became an academic as a computer hacker I lived in Israel I had a cybersecurity company and my job was to break into people's 
computers and it, it plant uh, false information or extract information. So, so I was playing that. And back then, I came up with the best method for me to know that my computer wasn't hacked, which applies to that. And I call it the April Fool's approach. If it's April Fool right now, it's not. But let's say it was April 1st, and I told you, oh, guys, you know, I'm an astronaut. I would say that. You would say, wait, we heard the words. We even trust Moan. He's like a trustworthy person, academic. We know he has this Columbia thing. We think he's like, but it's April 1st, and we know it's a day where kind of people play this game. So we're going to randomly choose a few facts that he says to not trust. And you're going to look at even things that seem realistic with a skeptical eye. I think this should be the approach for reality as we get to a world where everything could be not trusted. Mm -hmm. New York Times could be hacked by someone and then suddenly you'll see an article and you would trust it because you trust New York Times, but then it would not be the truth and so on. If you say every now and then I play this game where occasionally, randomly, I pick one piece of news and I treat it, it like April 1st. And say, even though it comes from a, a legitimate source, it's from Marcus that I always know tells the truth. But occasionally I decide it's April 1st and I kind of look at it, you will... It's, it's what the tax auditing is doing by the IRS. Occasionally, you take a regular person and you audit them. This will allow you to, in a way, protect yourself from randomly being hacked. You won't protect from everything. You will still be. But occasionally, right. one, once, a, once a week, you say, even though my best friend says that, and they're in my echo chamber, and I trust what they say, I'm going to go and vet that information thoroughly. Because I might realize that this friend is mistaken, or that I'm in an echo chamber, or that he is getting wrong information and I need to go to a different source. And this this is not foolproof because you still will do it unless you do it all the time. It's it's not foolproof, but it's a way to help your brain protect. Uh, by the way, I, 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 would, check. I would yes and that with one thing. I think that's brilliant. One thing that I've advocated to folks is is under the under the 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 heading of red teaming yourself is forcing yourself. When you're when you're looking at a piece of information that is high stakes or you know that 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 is important, force yourself to look at something that that makes the counter argument, mm -hmm. and then the yeah. if you if you if you still are comfortable, if you still believe yes, that was the right thing, you know I, I do this. I'll give you a small example of how I do this to myself. The the one the one print magazine that I still read because I find it so valuable, and this is is foreign affairs because. It often has articles by people with different points of view on the same topic. And there are times when I'll start reading something and I'll be, this is just garbage. I mean, this is, this person's an idiot. They're arguing for an undefensible position. And then when I say that to myself, I'll say, okay, you have to finish this article because you don't lose anything mm -hmm. by, by reading. If it is a truly idiotic position or undefensible position, you don't lose anything. It's not going to, you know, you have to trust that you're not going to be so easily persuaded by faulty logic that, you know, but then, you know, and I would say nine times out of 10, I finish it and say, yeah, I was right. That really was a, a, a an undefensible position, but now I understand where those people are coming from. And I feel more confident that I, that my position on this is, is, is correct. One time out of 10, I'll say, huh, well, that's an interesting point that I didn't think of. Um, and what I, was I don't say. buy all of their argument, Perfect. but yeah. And I think that that's kind of a way of guarding against this too. Absolutely. I think, I think I was going to, I was going to supplement it by doing it yourself. And you just said it exactly right. I think that, uh, I think that occasionally saying, Hey, actually, maybe I did play tennis yesterday with my friend and I wasn't with Moan on this call would be a useful game to play with yourself. And fact check. Yeah, so. We had a Dr. Dealey McCabe on last year, which her game was fascinating. And she was talking about neuroplasticity and how, like any muscle, we can retrain our brain or we can focus the brain through exercise. And when, I remember one of the harrowing lines that she came up with when we were talking about children and how they're influenced with what we're talking about today. And she said that technology is now trumping DNA and how mm -hmm. children being consumed by technology, their bodies aren't growing at the rate they should do because the technology is stymieing the development of the brain. And at certain points, if the brain hasn't been used in a certain way, it shuts off and you can't regain that, hence the neuroplasticity. Plasticity. And I remember reading an article from you about what the advice you'd give to your younger self and the nine top tips. So you know, we've got a lot of younger listeners joining today, which is, always, which is always great to hear. What advice would you give to both the youth of today, our future generations and parents on the topic of what we're discussing? Okay, so, so I, uh, here, here's one. Um, for, okay, I'll give you uh, 
generally, here's one that I think I would give young people that I, would be relevant. And that is to uh, evaluate the pyramids you're climbing and ask yourself if you want to climb this pyramid. I'll, I'll be specific, I'll be, I'll be clear. I was a soldier, like you, Marcus. I, I spent five years in the Israeli army. And when you join the army, it's very clear what's the hierarchy. You know exactly who you have to salute and, and who gets to tell you what to do. And it's also uh, very clear that the higher up you are, the better the conditions are. You, you get the base for less hours. You, you uh, eat in a better yeah. uh, uh, kind of dining hall if you're an officer. Like everything looks better. Uh, so I immediately, like everyone else, started to say, okay, how do I become this officer of that rank? And I, you, you kind of start, and at some point, after five years in the army, I basically left and I went to university and I, and I, there was a new army there. Suddenly I was an undergrad and there were my TAs who were masters and, and it's, and I suddenly started to kind of see that everywhere I go, there's a pyramid and immediately my intuition is to say, okay, I'm going to want to climb to be the top. And then I said, okay, you have a finite time. You can't climb all of them. It's a good idea. Like I was a better academic than I was a soldier. I can tell you, I was in, I was in detention routinely for not shaving properly and not getting a, so I was not a great soldier on some do domains, but I was a great academic. But be when I was a soldier, it felt like the only thing I want to be is to be the head of the army. That was the head of the army. And I said, like, it's a good idea now that you had two pyramids that you now can say, every next time you find yourself in a pyramid, ask yourself before you start climbing, which, which is the intuition to start wanting to be, if I'm in a, in a workplace, I want to be the CEO. If I'm or, or a senior person, before you do this, like ask yourself, do you want to be like in this pyramid? And I think that because you can always change a pyramid and become the not you, you won't you won't be the CEO of this company, but you'll become the head of the army. And and I think that the, no one spends a lot of people don't spend a lot of time asking us if I want to be in this pyramid. They immediately, as soon as they are put in one, start to climb up, we'll look up. Mm. And I think that to me, this, is this, this trip is really necessary? Exactly. So <laughs> now, no, no, now I joined I joined Colombia, and immediately I asked myself the first question, like, okay. There's a clear kind of, uh, now I'm a professor, you can become a church professor, you can be vice dean, a dean, like they're kind of clear. And I can, I, I know what, what my process would look in the next 20 years if I choose a pyramid. Before you do that, do you want to be a dean in 20 years? Or do you maybe think that being a, a let's take a, you guys' experience, let's be a best-selling author. It's a new pyramid that I can now say, okay, I'm actually climbing this pyramid. My job would be to, and, and then choosing the pyramid, and not letting the default option of like, I am in one, so let's climb up is the best advice I would have given myself as a kid before you start climbing and spending 20 years doing that. Brilliant. Interesting. Brilliant. Interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to turn Marcus's question in the other direction. A lot of our listeners are our CEOs, our, our leaders in business, military, government. What are some of the things that, that you would advise leaders? to help improve their decision quality based on what you know about how our brains work and how they don't work. So, so I, I, the first one, I think we kind of discussed, but I'll say it especially know yourself. I think keep a diary for 10 days and write in this diary choices you make small and big, what to have for lunch and uh, who to call uh, when you're tired. And then at the end of the week, look back at this diary and only then rank your choices. So a week after say, okay, uh, for, for lunch, I had salmon, steak and salad. Uh, it was cold and I was alone and I chose the salad. And a week after I look back and I say, yeah, this was a good choice, thumbs up. And then look at choices 10, back, 10 days backward and kind of rank them thumbs up, thumbs down, and then see what's common to all the thumbs up one. All the thumbs up I made when I was with Bryce. All the thumbs down one I made in the morning. You, you'll start seeing this is the kind of, in, in lieu of a neuroscientist studying your brain, this is something everyone can do. Make decisions, record them, and look back after some time and, and rank them. That, that's kind of number one. And then you know yourself. You'll know right away, okay, I'm better in this case than in that case. And, and this is what we started earlier saying. If you know yourself, you can craft the conditions for you to make better decisions. The other one is pick, and I think you wouldn't be surprised by the red team approach, that pick people that you trust to tell you the truth when you're like in bad like so so pick like you know it could be your your yeah. husband or wife your child your best friend but you have you have to have a team that says to you mr president you're wrong publicly no, yes. embarrassingly and so on and i think that people yeah. tend to not do that people tend to uh, fire this person if they say to time so you might want to have multiple people but or, or divorce them if, if they, but i think that in a way <laughs> i think that having a trusted friend in your uh, decision making group that that can tell you everything that that's I think it's hard, but if you can create manufacture that person, you're gonna make better decisions. Your own personal red team. Yeah. Yeah. My my wife is my red team. 
Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's absolutely. And it's very yeah. tough because mm -hmm. you, you can't avoid not liking, you, you, you hate them, right? When they tell you uh, you're, you're mistaken, what you've been working for hours on writing a paper, like I'm taking my space, and then someone comes to you and, and says, this is all crap. I'm sorry, but it's bad. And we're going to start from zero. You don't just like feel bad about yourself. You feel you hate this person and you find many reasons why they're flawed and they don't understand and so on. And you have to have to, in your mind saying like this guy, I assigned to them the role of telling me it's crap. So even though I think that they're wrong and so on, I have to trust myself from a week ago that's assigned them the role. And that's why, uh, you know, I'll give you an know, example that, that, it would, that I like, uh, even though it's going to use a word that is probably not allowed in podcasts. Uh, oh, it is. Or, <laughs> from oh, Pixar. I was here. I spent some time talking to a friend of mine who works for Pixar, the, the animation company, and they said mm -hmm. because Pixar is animation, uh, you don't really you can you can film it linearly, right? Like you can basically in, in movies you kind of film all the scenes that happen in the house on day one and all the scenes, and then right. you edit differently. But in, in Pixar, you just work on it like linearly. You you draw scene one, scene two. You kind of you do that. Uh, so the movie is supposedly done. What commonly happens is the directors of the movie do what's called a pixel fucking which is they watch the movie and they say, no, no, this red dot is not red enough. Let's do it again. Render it. They keep, and so Pixar assigns one person whose job is one thing to say the movie is ready. <laughs> so the director is head of the pyramid, <laughs> the, but the director is the head of the pyramid who's also attached to it so much that he keeps like changing and so on. So there's one yep. guy above the, above the director whose job is to say, director, the movie, we're taking it away from you. We're, we're launching it. Otherwise they keep enough, pixel enough. fucking. And that's, I think two, yeah. four. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, the, I, that resonates deeply with me, and, and I, and I, I know it resonates say, deeply with Marcus. With that. I'm going to create another word for that. You know, this is the thing is now I'm going to tell you, Moran. Now, I guarantee you, I am going to hear the word pixel fucking from Marcus yeah. every day. He's going to say, Bryce, <laughs> you're pixel fucking again. We can, we can change it to yeah. pixel mating. Exactly. Yeah, well, that's all right. It's, yeah. it's, we're, 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 uh, we're big kids here. <laughs> um, so we'll make Sam put the e the e logo on uh, on, on this episode, but uh, no, you know it's it's so true. And both of these things having, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a shout out to a book I've cited before, and I this this book, which is pretty arcane, um, "Defeat into Victory" by Field Marshal Viscount Slim, who was the commander of Allied forces in the Burma Theater in World War II, um, and. I, I've talked about this, this before. I won't. I won't recount the whole thing. But you know, suffice it to say, he he is utterly defeated by the Japanese in the early days of World War II. But instead of going home and looking his wounds, he he learns from how they defeated him and and becomes the only general to defeat the Japanese on the ground in World War II. Which most people don't realize that that that, that Japan lost the war because of logistics and the, and the atom bomb, not because they were defeated on, on the battlefield, except by Slim. And, and one of the things that, that Slim did when he was stunned by the, by the fact that he was allowed to retain his command after being driven out of Burma in 1941 is he called up uh, an old friend of his from Sandhurst, who was a brigadier. And he said, I want you to join my staff. He said, great. What, what, what am I going to be? S1, S2, S, he's not, not going to be anything. He says, your job is going to be to review every plan, every strategy that we come up with and tell me why it's going to fail. And the interesting thing that Slim talks about in here is he says in the entire course of the war, he never once abandons a plan and doesn't do it because of what this general tells him. But at the same time, he never once fails to make at least one modification to it based on that. Good idea. Yeah, okay. and so he's he's doing what you advocate there, and having this personal red team, this person on his staff whose job is simply to tell him, "Here's what what you want to do. Here's how it's going to fail." But he's also not being paralyzed by that. He's not saying, "Oh gosh, you know, yeah, there's, that's a bad idea." Okay, well, let's sit and think it, you know, because he knows they have to act and stuff. So that coupled with with this with this decisive function, I I've often imagined how much better. And <laughs> I've never told Marcus this, but I've often imagined how much better decisions would I make if if there was an artificial mechanism that in, you know, fill in the blank, five minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is after after something comes up, a trap door is going to open under my desk and my and I'm going to fall through it. And, and if I haven't if I haven't hit a button to make it make the decision by that point, it's not going to happen. 
And it's kind of a comical example, but it's something that I think about in my head because, you know, I'm one of those people who will, who will play with that red pixel I'm All getting some long. great ideas from this show today. I'm going to have the Gretchen's <laughs> going to get some workmen around to install a trapdoor. I'm going to have a button here that I can push. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a lot. The next episode is going to be a lot of fun, Moran. You should come back on again and watch Bryce disappear. <laughs> <laughs> this is great advice, Moran. There's so much more I'd love to talk with you about. We'll have to have you back on the show if you're, if you're willing. As this is, I, I feel like we've just barely skim the surface of some of this stuff. And a lot of this stuff is emergent too. But thank you so much for taking the time to talk it's with a us pleasure. today. It was great fun. Truly brilliant. Thank you so much. Learned, learned a lot. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>